Okay, number four, the best British movie is Spectre. For you, I have to risk it Cause the writing's on the wall. Yep, the 24th James Bond movie. My, the latest installment of my favourite film franchise. Spectre. Whoa. Again, we rewatched this, I rewatched this one. Um, I've rewatched Hotel Dren, sorry, Night at the Museum, Secret of the Tomb and Jurassic World and Shaun the Sheep movie and one of the next three I think this is probably going to be Daniel Craig's last one to be honest, Daniel Craig's James Bond uh, that's, that's not even confirmed yet though, there's still, there's a lot of speculation. So Spectre, the latest James Bond film, it features James Bond played by Daniel Craig solving mystery um, give, being given a cryptic message from his past, he goes off to um, find this assassin um, at the start of the film it goes out in probably one of the best opening um, shots of a movie ever one of the best shots of probably has been done in several tapes um, at a time so shot 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 it's been edited together to look like one long take I think there's a list there's a film on the list later on that does the same probably so yeah, yeah, and after ge killing this guy in the opening credits, um, P.S. My mum doesn't really like the song "Writings on the Wall." I think it's good. Um, titles are okay. Uh, I think they've gone a little downhill after Casino Royale, although they have gone a bit half better than Quantum Solid. It's kind of an up, down, up, down. So these ones are maybe on the same par as Skyfall. Seems like that break from one film has done Daniel Klein not as good. And not didn't do that him as well. Well Dying Up There wasn't that great. Didn't have a great title sequence either. Um they do look visually stunning though, which is more than it could be said for some of the Morris Binder ones and the Robert Brown John ones. And they're definitely better rendered than, than that being said, those ones are better rendered than MK12's Quantum Solace one. Yeah. Uh, top Daniel Kleinman does do a good job with them. And uh, I like how it's similar to the Ornamentary Secret Service title sequence by showing clips or from the previous film or having the type, some stuff from the title sequence be similar to scenes or moments from the previous three films. As well as scenes from the upcoming, from the film, this film. Um, yeah, that's actually quite clever and well done. Um, my particular favourite bit of the title sequence is the octopus coming out behind um, Christoph Waltz's character in the title sequence. Sorry, my pen. That's really good. And when you actually see this, the scene isn't as interesting in the actual film. It's quite quiet. The characters are pretty quiet and they don't do much. Thankfully, there's a um, honest trailer that actually plays, talks about this for a bit. In fact, they claim the film is pretty boring. And there is... I think those are probably the closest to being boring. But the film is pretty, really good. Um, it's a really good film. Um, Lots of great characters. Radio Times gave it three stars, but Barry Norman only said the plot was, said only the plot was not up to scratch, but everything else was really was up to, was top notch, but apart from the script slash plot. My question is why didn't you give it a four star then? Four star would have fitted well for Spectre. Definitely fits better than Quantum of Solace. I'd even say go far as say probably fits it better than Spy Who Loved Me. Oh I'm gonna hate for that. Um, yeah, um, I think really Spectre is one of the best. I think it's one of the good ones, one of the better ones, but not one of the best. Skyfall, oh, the one that it follows, Skyfall, the previous one, is definitely the best. It's it's the best film I've ever seen. And Spectre is supposed had at one point supposed to have topped Skyfall, um, but I don't think it ever will. 
It's a good film. It's really good. I don't think it was top Skyfall or even Casino Royale. Definitely will top Quantum of Solace. And I think it does die another day. Uh, if I was to go through the whole list, I'd probably be here all afternoon. Well, at least the next, take up the next several slots. Um, okay, I'd say it's better than most, but not as good as some. Um, of the older ones. Just sum it up. If that overall, better than most, but not as good as some. That's Spectre in a nutshell. Um, I haven't finished talking about the plot, did I? Um, after, after the titles, we then see Bond goes to the funeral, and then he meets the widow, and then that she leads him to Spectre, who then leads him to Mr. White again, and then to his daughter, and then they have to uncover the mystery of the organisation. In fact, it's um, Madeline Swan, Mr. White's daughter, um, is actually the one who tells him the organisation is called Spectre. And at the end, and later in the film, you then realise a trick. There's also this plot about a uh, Bond's past that come that rounds up at towards the end, and then you get a really final ending in London, and a really tense boat. And actually, it's very tense. The scenes in the MI6 building are very tense. Um, yeah, it's probably the most tense ending, at least since Casino Royale. Uh, Skyfall had very tense, but it was very action-packed. This one has a little less action. Um, when, in London, at least. Um, at least the DMI 6 bit. You, um, it's definitely more tense than action. Which works for this one, though, to be honest. It works better here than in the others. Um, and Andrew Scott's character is great. He's obviously the villain, because he's very... Because the character is very like Moriarty from Sherlock. If the character had been written a little bit differently, he, we probably would have suspected he wasn't that bad. It probably wouldn't be as evil as obvi obviously evil. Hopefully Andrew Scott can get roles where he isn't the obvious bad guy. Um, because of his role in Sherlock as Moriarty. P.S. Andrew Scott is fantastic as Moriarty. He's probably the best one I've seen. Gerard Harris does a good job in sh A Game of Shadows, but... Uh, but Andrew Scott is probably the best Moriarty. Easily, no question about it. Yeah, so Andrew Scott was the obvious bad guy in the film. A obvious bad guy. So Christoph Waltz and Dave Bautista, we already knew, was a bad guy. Was a henchman. Christoph Waltz also has a twist reveal that most people thought was obvious. Yeah, that's pretty obvious, to be honest. If you made it another character, then it probably wouldn't be as obvious, but you made the most obvious character have this twist in. Oh, I'm going to spoil it. This is a spoiler. This is a spoiler filled uh, list. Franz Oberheiser, Christoph Waltz's character, is the. Uh, sorry. Is Ernst Stavro Bro Brofeld. He's Blofeld, to be honest. He's a more um, fitting Blofeld for the 21st century, similar to Spectre for the. fit uh, more uh, serious Spectre than the campy 60 70 ones. Well, I say campy. Um, not as serious. Um, it wasn't. It was quite serious, but not as serious in the sixties and seventies. Um, but well, very early seventies. But this one's a bit more of a serious organisation. It's not too different to Quantum, which was technically Spectre before they got the rights. Um, it's very like Quantum. It's a very modern organisation. It's very real, and this is a pretty much real Blofeld for this organisation, and Waltz does a good performance, I won't say he's the best, I think I would go with Donald Pleasance or Charles Gray, um, best or favourite, or even one of the guys in the chair stroking the cat, and we don't even see the face, it's just another actor doing the voice, two actors, I think I'll go with the ones from, from Russia 11 on them, over to my four years only one though. Tell you if Spallus does a good job on Her Majesty's Secret Service, though. Maximum Zai, though, from Star Wars, The Force Awakens, doesn't really, um... is in the unofficial Never Say Never, one Never Say Never Again, but doesn't get much to do. Um, strangely, no Blofeld in the Casino Royale spoof, but then again, he only appeared late, a few months later, and he only twice, properly. So yeah, Spectre. I've rambled about Spectre, well, not exactly Spectre, the Bond franchise and Sherlock, because of Andrew Scott. 
quite enough now. I would say, I would round up Spectre by saying it is a pretty brilliant film. Follow up to Casino, sorry, follow up to, to Skyfall. Um, but it isn't the great, it's not one of the greatest. It will stand out as one of the better ones, but not one of the greatest. Unlike Skyfall or even Casino Royale, actually, to be honest. Um, I find that one of the best, uh, one of the greatest. But Skyfall is no doubt the best, and while Spectre tries, it just can't compete. You've been blowfilled. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, number four is Spectre. Okay, number three. This is the other movie that uses that. That makes you believe it's one whole take. But it's, uh, is that still on? Yeah, it's still one whole take. Yeah, I just want to check this properly. Sorry, guys, I just had to check that. This is the... Okay. Number number three is the other film on this list that makes you believe this is done in what the opening has been done in one take, but may um, but because of what I have spec it, it makes me think maybe actually this one actually did it the same way and just edited it all together. So this is really good, it, good how it does it. So number three is Marvel's Avengers: Age of Ultron. This was probably the one of the most anticipated movies of the year, along with Star Wars The Force Awakens, I would say. Um, and yeah, the end result is good. I would, again, I would probably prefer this over the first one, like with Hotel Transylvania 2 and Ted 2. Um, and the remake, and the Cinderella remake. But... It's still a, it's a really good, but there are a few problems and issues. It is a really good film, though. Um, the problems and issues don't really get in the way of anything. In fact, I don't know, there aren't even that many. I don't even think of any. Um, yeah, I think this is really good. Um, I don't really have much to say on this. The plot is that uh, the Avengers are trying to catch get Loki's staff back from a base. I can't remember the organisation. I think they're relevant to something in the comics. Uh, the, the, they have um, Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver working for them. This is a, the, these are different ones to the X Men ones because of the franchise right, film rights from Disney and Fox, uh, 20th Century Fox, which is probably where we're going to be seeing Scarlet Witch at least, yeah, not for a while at least. Maybe the next film. And it's why we've got different timelines and different actors for these characters. We were similar, but not alike. Um, and then these characters, these two, eventually join forces with Ultron, which is a which Tony Stark and Bruce Bruce Banner, yeah, Bruce Banner, aka Iron Man and Hulk, um, before as their usual selves, create to help protect the world from peace. However, it goes evil. Um, takes over Jarvis, um, and will pretty much becomes the bad guy, the film, an unstoppable villain that they created. So they have to go up against the villain that they created, as well as these two uh, powerful people. Although they do turn sides uh, later, near the end of the film, to help the Avengers fight off Ultron and his army. Um, and also, we also get a new character, Vision, and some of the other side characters that help it out in the other films such as Vulcan, uh, sorry, Falcon and Iron Patriot. Um, you see that, and they'll be back in the next in Civil War, of course. Um, we're back in Civil War. I'm sorry, the next Marvel film, um, I think is Doctor Strange with Benedict Cumberbatch, again from Sherlock. Then yeah, Age of Ultron. Oh, brilliant. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. brilliant. Oh, and the voice of um, Ultron, um, James something, I think it's, I was, I'm going to say Horner, but I, that, James Horner, but that's a musician, I think, if I'm saying the name right. James Marsden, it wasn't him. Um, 
It was Jane String Spin Spinder. Spinsler. Jane Spinsler. Great voice. No, I don't think anyone else could have been a better choice than me. Well, as I think about it, maybe Christopher Lee before he passed away last year. Or maybe um Tangled or maybe Martin Morgan Freeman. Um, speaking of which, um, not Morgan Freeman, I just remember Samuel L. Jackson. Um, Samuel L. Jackson um, is in this as well. He has a cameo as um, what's his, uh, Nick Fury. Sorry, I almost forgot his name, which is a crime against Marvel. <laughs> it is a, yeah, it's crime against Marvel. Nick Fury at the end. Uh, yeah, not at the end, sorry. In the film, about halfway, he makes an appearance, and it's a nice little appearance from Samuel Jackson. So, yeah. Very good. Very nice. So, uh, yeah. Along with Martin Freeman, Morgan Freeman, he's one of the best actors out there. Uh, at least since the 90s. He was in Jurassic Park as well, by the way, if you, if you remember. Um, but he's also in well, but I think, and also Star Wars prequels, but I think he's mostly well known for Pulp Fiction and for Snakes on the, that like one line, those, that line in Snakes on the Plane. I've had it with these mother effing snakes on this, no I'm going to do it properly, I'm going to, I've had it with these motherfucking snakes on this motherfucking plane, but louder. Yeah. He's great, and I think this one cemented the role. It cemented him, the role of Nick Fury. Yeah, he's great. Okay, moving on. Number two. This one, people... Now, these next two, people are probably not going to be surprised at. Though they may be surprised at which order they are in. They won't be surprised that they're these top two. So number number two is the best animated movie of the year I saw, and that is Inside Out. Okay, Inside Out. Um, this one is really good. This one has a lot of really good emotions. It teaches really good lessons. It makes you feel like the characters. It makes you question if you've got these th emotions inside. It's a shame there's only five emotions. As people who seem to have so many. This has proven a point um, in Doctor Who when they're talking to Daleks or Cybermen, for example. The Doctor will talk, usually say that, or even when he's talking to anyone, to be honest, he will mention emotions are great. So, yeah, so these emotions, uh, there's a shame with only five, but um, that's enough for the film, for now at least. Um, maybe we'll get another one as, as Riley grows up, but five's enough for now. Um, strangely, Riley's one's a mixed gender, whilst everybody other characters are the same gender as the person. Um, Riley's got two male emotions rather than everybody just having five male or five female. Um, depending on your gender, so for example, I could have five male emotions inside me. Riley is probably the, is the only one in the film to have a mixed gender um, series on that. Either that would have two male ones that could become female in, when they grow up. But even then, but even then, it doesn't make sense. I don't know what, what the reasoning was. Maybe they just wanted two male characters, two main male characters. Um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't think anyone dislikes Inside Out. I don't think there's... I think everyone loves it. And there's a really strong reason for that. And it's called Inside Out. <laughs> it, it's the movie. It's the, the movie is per, almost perfect. Um, there's a few plot issues. Well, not plot issues. I question some of the characters' mo actions. But as terms of story, it works. It's a good story. It's really good. The emotions are great. The acting is great. Oh, there's another main, male character. And that's a... Um, it's a imaginary character who's real in the mind, but not at all. There's a very funny um, how it should have ended short where they do make that character real, and <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I really like that. It's sad when he dies. 
all gets erased from existence. He was a really good character. You might you might find him annoying at the start, but when he when you get to know him, he gets more. He gets not. He's a better character. Excuse me. I'm gonna open the window. It might be wet. Okay now. Okay. Good. Good. I think late afternoon is the best time to have a window open when you're recording. Yeah, okay. Um, I hope it'd be the last take. Yeah, now, the character's name's Bing Bong, by the way. Um, he's like an elephant, pink, wears a kind of a shirt, jacket, blazer thing, and a hat. Now, he was also a nostalgia critic uh, review of um, Osmosis Jones, which I've seen part of. Has, does have it very similar? It does say it, very, it is very similar to that film? They have p things inside your body. Uh, they have films that are memories of the character of the human. Uh, some other stuff. It's very. It, it does have similarities to Osmosis Jones. And whilst that one didn't get a very good reception, uh, like they said in the film, is someone could have taken those ideas and used it for Inside Out. Um, which, d um, I've seen a bit of Osmosis, but it's not... Um, it's good, I think. But Inside Out is far superior. In fact, I would say this is the best... I have only I've seen every single Pixar film. I think I've seen most of them. I think the only one I haven't seen is Bugs Life. I think that's the only one I haven't seen. Oh, and, the, oh, and good, good Dinosaur. Uh, Finding Dory hasn't been released yet, so I probably won't see that just... I'm predicting my schedule. It's probably not going to be one I will be able to see if I do get to see any others. Any other... Any this, this July, August. Uh, it's not likely to be one I do get to see this summer. Maybe later on, maybe later on in life I will be able to go back and revisit it. Um, I've got a Viking Nemo on DVD, so... Yeah, I think the only two I've ever seen are Bugs Life, which I could have had the chance to, but I never got round to doing it, and Good Dinosaur, which did, uh, we just skipped, which we skipped. We just passed on. Um, yeah, number one best Pixar movie I've seen, out of all of them apart from two, for if you count Finding Dory, um, even though it's not been released in the UK yet, um, Inside Out is the best. Inside Out. It would have been the latest if Good Dinosaur had been released earlier. Yeah, Inside Out, brilliant movie. Really makes you think, really makes you feel. It's a really good story. Okay, and on to my number one pick, and I bet you've all guessed by now. It is, of course, Star Wars The Force Awakens. <laughs> Well, this is pretty great story. We had a really great story. We come back. Uh, my main problem with the story, though, however, is that it does feel like more like Episode Eight, whilst Episode Seven was completely skipped, and this was post. This was made to be eight. In fact, there's actually a book that explains the stuff between Episode Six and Episode Seven. This isn't Episode. Hang on. This isn't A New Hope. We where you don't have to worry about what's come before, and even if you've seen. And then when you do get the prequels, they do ex establish quite a lot in that, and it's an, and that that and also probably the upcoming anthology films are, are and probably going to be enough to establish the universe prior to the events of A New Hope. Uh, but however, The Force Awakens just dives right into a universe set thirty years after Return of the Jedi, and my main problem is is that it doesn't always try explain. The events that happened. It meant it does sometimes, but it doesn't really explain this. There's actually a book about it, uh, revealing some plot details. And to be honest, I think that should have been a film. I think the stuff in the book should be a film. It should at least be an a future anthology film after the next three are done. So when they're doing ten, eleven, twelve, they should do an anthology, uh, maybe two anthro an anthology trilogy on how episodes. Even if how episodes six and seven connect with these plot details, details if they have to be based on this book, well one or two, the third one could be a bit different, could be a bit different. 
Um, but yeah, but ignoring the um, big uh, post, but this era being complete, mostly overlooked, we do get a good story to return us to the universe of Star Wars after a ten-year break following um, the prequel trilogy with the Revenge of the Sith, with Revenge of the Sith as the last one. Well, be glad it was only ten years. Seven if you're counting the Clone Wars film from 2008. Um, if you look at the time gap between Return of the Jedi and The Phantom Menace, it's about nearly 20. Um, it's about 16. Yeah, it's about 16 year gap between Return of the Jedi and Phantom Menace. So be glad you only got a 10 year gap between Revenge of the Sith and The, the Force Awakens. And the fact that they're, they're planning it, they're thinking of having a further. It's only two year gap as opposed to three year gap between films, with an anthology film taking those year gaps, plus the fact there might be, I think, you'll, as another trilogy later on. It's like we're going to be getting quite a bit of Star Wars for, for now, and not too long into the future either. That being said, by the time they do get to episode 12, does that mean they're going to do more, or to stop with episode 12? I think maybe 12 could be a good end, ending spot, like 60. Six is a good enough number. Um, but like we got Mordo. Very good. in fact number seven was actually my favourite for a while, I and mean, then I started thinking actually six might be better. Rewatched both of them. In fact I rewatched all of them. Uh number seven again on Blu-ray. Um oh, the others were on DVD, PS Fantastic DVDs for the prequel trilogies. If you can get the two disc DVDs, um fantastic. The yeah, did I mention this in a video at some point? I think I might have. Um, prequels to fan. I think I, I'm not sure when it might have been something. Uh, yeah, um, say what you like about the prequels, but they got 10 out of 10 DVD cost coverage, just like Die Another Day did. Um, the originals were in a. If you got the one, I don't know if you can get a two disc set of those, but you can get them one disc set indivi individually or part of a box set um, with a bonus material disc, and then both would be really Both trilogies were released with just films inside them, so the first DVD um, box set with the originals had a bonus material disc. Um, so I think the new Star Wars film doesn't have much extras on the new DVD, it's all on the Blu-ray and there's been a lot of complaints and Disney doesn't seem to, and Disney's claimed that they only put, they don't put extras on DVDs anymore apart from a few shorts, a short on some of the DVDs like Frozen or Wreck, not really out there. Well, maybe uh, Big Hero Six. Whilst all the Blu-ray, whilst the Blu-ray gets all the other, all the good stuff. That's a little unfair. You can have more stuff on Blu-ray than DVD, but it's not nice to have everything. And even then, there's not much. If you look at Ant-Man and Star Wars: Force Awakens, everything's on the Blu-ray, and even then, there's not much. Um, well, it's not such. If you had to look at, like I said, look at the prequel DVDs and Die Another Day, they had tons of stuff, and that's just DVD. They probably hardly have anything apart from in that big Blu-ray box set. Now, on later releases. Oh well, back to the film. Um, I'm, I'm glad we don't get to see much of Luke Skywalker. It would very. Um, it would have been nice to see him a bit more, but it still works. Harrison Ford as Han Solo is brilliant. Uh, we don't get much of Leia. In fact, Leia's always been my least favourite of the trio. Um, and this, although now, uh, spoiler alert, Han Solo's gone. Um, she may. Um, it's just out her and Luke. So, I'm, again, I wasn't so keen on Han Solo. I like Han Solo. I just wasn't so keen on him uh, just in the recent watchings of number four and maybe bits of five. But they got better as the time goes on. He's definitely at his best in number seven. And um, number seven is Han Solo at his best. Um, I like him more in six than I do in five and four. Um, particularly four. Um, yeah, number seven, Han Solo is at his best, which is good because it's his final one, apart from that spin off, but we'll, we'll see about that. Um, it's going to be a different actor anyway. Um, the new characters, I like Daisy Ridley, but I don't think she's brilliant. I think she's got enough potential though, so she's going to be really good. And probably be really good in the future ones. 
I think there's room for expansion, and the mystery of her family. Pretty obvious, but it's nice that we've got it. We've got a nice background. It's pretty obvious she's Luke's, da obvious she's Luke's daughter. It'd be a pretty good twist if she it turned out she wasn't. Or Luke, Leia, and Han's daughter. The rumours saying that uh, Jin Arson from the upcoming Rogue One is going to be her mother. So, does that mean Jin Arson survives the events of Rogue One and the, pre the, the original trilogy and marries Luke, Luke slash his, give his birth, gives birth to his daughter? I think Jin's going to die in the, pre in the film. That would be a really good twist. If for, here's a good twist for Rogue One. Here's a good idea. Jin's talking to her father about stuff. He's like, I'm sorry, Jin. She's like, what's going on? What? And then Darth Vader stabs her with the lightsaber. Oh, that would be a great moment. Just have her talking to her father, and then Darth Vader kills her. If, if you're not having Jin killed off by Darth Vader, kill off one of the others. Kill off one of the other characters by Darth Vader. Exactly how I just said it. Well, proving, okay, through the heart, yeah, through, the, through the stomach or the heart or something, through the body, from behind. Not necessarily talking to a, another character, just maybe looking around and then... That'd be great. It's a bit violent, and I do want Rogue One to get a PG rather than a 12A, as unlikely that seems. Um, but, yeah, I think, I've, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff in The Force Awakens, it's really good. Um, I don't mind the character at the bar so much. I think there's more room for her in expansion. I like the Stormtrooper Finn. He's probably my favourite of this new trio. Um, Pair, which is Ray, Finn, and Poe. Poe because more than Poe because he didn't get to do much. But I really like Oscar Isaac. I think he's probably one of my favourite actors in the film. And he's definitely brilliant in the Bourne Legacy and in X Men Apocalypse. Although he gets little to do in Born Legacy and Apocalypse. Um, you can't really see him properly because he's underneath makeup and stuff. And heavy costume, maybe even a bit of CG if I'm not mistaken. So here is the best chance he can get a bit of Oscar Isaac. Again, not so much, but he could be in the next one. Yay! I'm looking forward to seeing him. I would like to see him in more stuff. Yeah, so, yeah looking forward to more Oscar Isaac. Um, Chewy. <laughs> Every film since episode 3, um, chronologically, every, with, he wasn't in 1 and 2. Um, and yeah, rawr, he's back, it's like, mm, it's so awesome. I mean, how can you not love Chewie, and, well, unless he's getting really, really loud and whiny, but that doesn't happen in the films, much. Um, there is a Star Wars holiday special where he has a whole family doing his one every, every, every second, or almost every second. I haven't seen the thing, but I've seen clips in the review of Nostalgia Critic. Um, yeah, um, yeah, I think that's pretty much, oh, the villains. I almost forgot the villains. Um, Kylo Ren. Actually, it was a bit surprising that he was actually... Um, Leia and Han's son, although this doesn't come as a twist later on in the film, it comes about midway. It's so after they meet Ray and Finn, meet Han Solo. Oh, and BB-8, he's good. BB-8's a good guy, he's good. He's like R2-D2 of the films, even though R2-D2 is in it. As a C-3PO, they're good. But they don't do much, particularly Don 2. Or Luke. Yeah, Kylo Ren is really good, he's like a a wannabe Darth Vader, and he really tries, he tries his really damn hardest to become Darth Vader, and his actual real name is Ben Solo, which is a nice nod to Obi-Wan's, um, what the name Obi-Wan went by over the years as a hermit, as in, in episode 4, and it's what he was called by Luke in 4 and 5, before Luke actually decided to call him oh, by his proper name in episode 6. Actually, I think it's both names in six. So, yeah. Um, and Andy Circus is Empress Smoke, who is a giant. I'm sorry, is he an emperor? Now, uh, oh, well, he's the leader anyway, and he's this giant, bald headed. Thing. 
and appears from somewhere. He's really good, he's got a really good voice. Yeah, he's very good. Um, and we've also got Dominic G Gleeson and Gwendoline Trist Tristanton as a um, kind of a gen, not quite a general, it's kind of like the ad more like an ad like the Admiral so Admiral Draken by played by Peter Cushing in the fourth film. Um, it's one of those he's the guy who gives that big hit in the speech in one of the scenes. And the meanwhile uh, Gwendoline is the first female stormtrooper general. You don't see her head her face, but you do hear her voice. I think it's the first time we've had a female as a stormtrooper. So that's nice. And she gets a much better uniform as well. Oh, and there's a very funny joke from a very funny nod to episode 4 when you get dispatching for her. I, I'm not sure how she and the Admiral person, the Dominic Gleeson's character, survived the um, destruction of the base. But I think that they are definitely in the next film as well. So they're definitely in episode 8. Uh, making this more of a connected story, I suppose. It's because some characters from 4 were not in 5, some were not in 5, or in 6, for example. And yeah, oh, and Admiral Ackpark from episode 6 returns for a bit. I don't know if he'll be in the next one, though. Um, oh, and there's a few other cat, and there's another alien from episode 6 that makes an appearance in episode 7. It's that one that was with Lando at the end of in the Millennium Falcon. Not sure why Lando isn't back. Billy D. Williams was rumoured to be in it, but he wasn't. So, if Lando does come, I would like Lando to come back for episode 8. He could continue Han's legacy, or something, or maybe just help out a bit. Another thing I probably would like for episode 8 is Ghost Yoda coming to help train. I, I don't know why, it just make, it sounds like a good idea, Ghost Yoda. Uh, it's just a, it's a good idea just like Darth Vader stabbing Jyn Arson in, in Rogue One, or any other character. But that scene probably would have fitted. But the scene with talking to her father would have fitted well. So yeah, I've rambled on long enough. Star Wars The Force Awakens is brilliant. It's got very good story. Great characters. Great st action. Great stuff. It does have a few issues. But overall, it is a fantastic movie. And I'm sure you'll like it. Thank you for watching this probably. Hi guys. Sorry about that. Um camera footage just stopped. Yeah, so anyway, uh, thank you for watching my ranking, and I hope to see you next time. Uh, before we finish, here's a reminder of the list. So, number 13 was Terminator Genesis. Number 12, Minions. Number 11, Hotel Transylvania 2. 10, Night at the Museum, Secret of the Tomb. 9, Ant-Man. 8, Ed 2. 7, Cinderella. 6, Jurassic World. 5. Shaun the Sheep Movie 4. Spectre 3. Marvel's Avengers Age of Ultron 2. Inside Out and number 1 was Star Wars The Force Awakens So yeah, thank you for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye!